Welcome everybody for the, the second day of the GRC and ERSA uh, Winter School. And today you have a very, very interesting uh, program with two um, uh, speakers and a, a lab uh, conference. And also you have to, to, to speak all together to make your presentation. But this morning we start immediately with the first uh, lecture. And it's uh, the lecture of uh, Louis Dijkstra. So Louis is an economist. He's the head of the economic analysis sector in the Directorate General for Regional and Urban Policies of the European Commission. And he's the editor of a cohesion report and regional working paper series. And also is a visiting professor at the London School of Economics. So Louis uh, holds a PhD in urban and regional planning from Rutgers University, and his recent work covers topics such as uh, global definition of cities and rural areas, transport performance, geography of EU discontent, and quality of government and gender equality. And now today we'll speak about um, demography and of also uh, EU discontent. So Louis, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andre. Let's see how my IT skills measure up and I can actually share my screen. You'd think after a year working from home, I should be able to do this, right? Probably. <laughs> uh, here we go. Did you confirm you can see my screen and you yeah, can see it in full screen? Yeah, we can see it uh, and we can hear you so you can start, of course. Okay, so what I'm going to do in the next 40 minutes or so is I'm going to try and summarize three pieces of work that I've been working on. Uh, one was uh, done for the demography report, which came out last year. Uh, another piece is for the urban rural divide on anti-EU voting, a working paper we published uh, late last year, and also some work I'm doing now on the long-term vision for rural areas. So that's kind of three components I kind of want to take you through. Uh, uh, what we know and what we can learn about rural areas today. So um, let's take a look. So for the demographers among you, this is the kind of classic decomposition of population growth. So if you look on the map on the left, you see the total population growth in uh, the last five years at the nuts three level. Red means reductions in population, blue means growth. So you can see, for example, uh, uh, southern Germany, um, Ireland, Sweden grew quite quickly over that period, in part because, of course, you had the influx uh, from, from uh, refugees. But you see also large chunks of the Union shrinking in terms of population, shrinking sometimes more than five, uh, uh, five per meal, so five per thousand inhabitants each year over that period. If you look closely, you can quite clearly see uh, an urban rural split there as well. You can often see the capital in blue with population growth, like Warsaw and its surrounding area, or uh, Budapest or Sofia, etc. But a lot of the remaining uh, regions tend to, tend to shrink also in the Baltics or Finland, and large chunks of Portugal and Spain uh, saw population reductions. Now, of course, the question is, why is that population shrinking, right? And so the traditional thing to do is look on the one hand at the net migrations, inflows minus outflows, and then you look at natural population change. These three maps all have exact same classes, so you can kind of judge the, the relative importance of, 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 of each of these two components. And you can see net migration is positive uh, overall in the Union, positive in, in large parts of Germany, Sweden, Ireland, the Benelux, Northern Italy and, and, and Southern France. But then if you look in the East and in Spain and Portugal and in Greece, you can see many regions actually losing population to migration, meaning more people left than, than arrived. And then if you see natural population change, you see that the colors become a bit darker uh, especially on the red end of the spectrum. So natural change is really the main driver of population reductions in the EU today. And that's partially because um, you may have heard of a population pyramid. Initially, it was actually a pyramid. Um, and now in Europe, it looks more like a mushroom. 
So there's a, a big cap of population that is actually a, a bigger cohort. They're now in their 20, you know, 30s and 40s. And as that grows, the, the next cohort is smaller. So as that grows up, actually the total population shrinks as that older population uh, starts to, to pass away. So that's exactly what we're seeing in, in, uh, in the natural population change there. And it affects many, many regions, right? So some still maintain a positive population, but that's only because the natural change is offset by a, a larger impact of net migration over. Moving on. So we can see here, uh, and I'll show you a series of these slides. These are always aggregated by uh, urban, rural, regional typology. So this is NUTS3 data, and we look at the trend. And I show you on the left-hand side, the situation for the union, and then on the right-hand side, all the member states ranked by the value for the rural regions. Now, what can you see? Overall population growth in urban and intermediate regions is still positive, although not particularly high. Um, and rural is just about negative. So it's, it is losing population slowly. But the interesting thing here is you can see the pattern by member states, right? Virtually all of the member states have a faster population reduction or a slower growth in rural regions than urban regions. So there's a very uniform pattern here. And so we're gonna try and figure out what's driving that pattern. So net migration actually is um, not what's causing population reductions in rural regions. This comes as a bit of a surprise to many people because they always assume that it, it, it's the people leaving the rural areas that, that's causing the, the reductions in population. But net migration in the EU to rural regions is positive. It's not positive in all uh, member states. You can see on the left-hand side uh, a, a number of eastern member states where net migration in rural regions is negative, sometimes substantially so, like in Latvia, La Latvia Lithuania, and Croatia. But you can also see many, uh, like Sweden, Germany, Ireland, Luxembourg, where actually it's it's positive. Um, uh, the 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 in migration. So on balance, rural regions gain population through migration. And this migration is age specific. Um, here we have estimated the, 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 the net migration rate per thousand people annually for different age group. On the far left, you can see the age group zero to 14. Then uh, you can see 15 to 39. And there, there you really have the bright colors, right? You have big inflows, big outflows. And as a result, could somebody mute their microphone? There's a bit of noise in the background. Um, and then that pattern uh, becomes less pronounced for the age group 40 to 64 and even less pronounced for the age group 65 plus. But the, the, the thing, interesting thing to, mat, to, to, to notice here is that the pattern changes. It's not just the intensity, but it's also the direction. If you look at the young adults, 15 to 39, you see a big inflow into the cities. It's primarily people going to a larger urban region looking for a higher education, looking for a first job, maybe looking for a partner. And this is really what is driving a lot. If you look at the second map, actually, that attraction of the city diminishes. And you see a slight return to at least to the suburban areas. Once you hit 65, the cities clearly lose out. You know, if you look in Germany and in Poland, but even in Czech Republic or, or Austria, the capitals tend to lose that part of the population and it moves out even beyond the suburbs and often into the rural regions. So there's a bit of a life cycle here, you know, with young adults streaming into the large urban areas, the uh, middle-aged adults, uh, moving to the suburbs and the retirees moving to uh, a, a further uh, regions there. So that's kind of the pattern. Now, there's a lot of discussion, of course, about, okay, how do you change population growth rates? And then uh, you have a lot of politicians favoring um, baby bonuses and, and, and you know, things to try and crank up the fertility rate. Now, the fertility rate in Europe is well below 2.1 replacement rate. It's not even on this chart, right? And rural fertility rates are actually higher. So the population losses in rural regions is not coming 
from a, a, a lower fertility rate than in urban regions. But it's a bit more complicated. Even though fertility rates so the average live births per woman over her lifetime um, is, um, doesn't necessarily tell you how many births will occur because the number of births actually depends not just on the number of women, but also their age composition. And so crude birth rates, the number of births per inhabitant, will you, is actually lower um, uh, in rural regions than it is in urban regions. And why is it lower? It's because that population is older. So here you can clearly see an old, almost universal pattern, right? Rural regions have the lowest crude birth rates, and it's because they have a higher median age. You know, the women living in rural regions tend to be older, and so more of them are also outside that childbearing age, and even the ones in the childbearing age are in the, the older cohorts uh, uh, where they're less likely to have children. And so here you can see a very clear pattern. Median age is higher uh, consistently in rural regions as compared to urban regions. So at the EU level, there's a difference about two years, uh, um, the 45 median age in rural regions compared to 42 in urban regions. Median age, for the ones who don't know, means that half the population is older, half the population is younger. And so, so here you can see that pattern. And in some cases, you know, the, the differences are really quite pronounced. For example, in Denmark, uh, the difference between only like 36 and, and 45 uh, between the urban and the rural regions. But it's not just the age distribution. There's something else going on, which I find quite interesting as well. And this is a pattern we also see outside uh, the EU, is that more women age 20 to 44 move out of rural regions than men do. And so at birth, uh, you have a, a higher proportion of males than females if there's no sex selection. No? So on average, it's about 170 boys per uh, um, 100 girls. Now, boys, and I used to be one, um, are not particularly, how shall I say, um, risk averse. As a result, not all of them uh, survive uh, their, their, their teenage years. So uh, really the, the, the number of boys uh, ending up, for example, in traffic accidents is, is three times higher than, than for women. So there's clearly some behavioral differences uh, uh, between men and women, which affect their, their survival rates, especially early on. But there's also clearly a, a gender selective uh, movement of population. And so here, what we show is the number of men aged 20 to 44 per 100 women of that age uh, in the urban rural typology. So if you live in a city, for each 100 men, there are about 100 women. If you live in a rural region, for each 100 women, there are 106 men. So assuming all of them want to partner up with the opposite sex in the same age group, that leaves some people out in the cold. Um, now, if you look across the member states, again, you see this is a very strong pattern, very consistent. And sometimes, you know, with, with much more extreme values than you get uh, at the EU. For example, in, in Romania, per, uh, 100, per 100 women, you only have 95 men. So there's actually an overrepresentation of women uh, in the urban regions in Romania compared to 110 men uh, in the rural regions per 100 women. Of course, the question is what's driving this? In part, it's the structure of the economy, you know, more manual labor in rural regions, more heavy duty farming jobs, maybe more manufacturing, less service jobs, uh, also less jobs for people with a tertiary education. Women are more likely to have a tertiary education if, she want, if they want to use that, they may need to, 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 to move to, to an urban region. Now, an older population also leads to a higher crude death rate. So here, clearly, you know, on average, uh, the likelihood of somebody that's older to, to pass away is higher than somebody younger. And as a result, you get clearly consistently higher, higher death rates in, in, uh, in the old rural regions as compared to the urban regions. So what is driving the um, uh, population reductions in rural regions? It's primarily the age structure um, and, and the shape of their, 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 their population distribution.
So it clearly leads to this negative natural change. Uh, and there you can see many regions, uh, many rural uh, regions per member state which have negative change. Quite a few managed to offset that by positive net natural migration, but far from all. So this is a little bit the story about uh, demographic change in, 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 in rural regions. And so we see a slow reduction in the population, in some cases fast, but in most cases quite slow. Uh, and that's primarily due to the population momentum. So, you know, built into the age structure, you, you see that the older cohorts are bigger than the, the younger cohorts. So even without any migration, these regions would shrink purely be, uh, because of a function of, of the population structure. Now, net migration tends to help, but it obviously doesn't help all uh, rural regions, uh, but it does reduce some of the population reductions caused by this population momentum. It, 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 age structure that is different in rural regions as compared to urban regions. Now, I want to emphasize that, uh, you know, the, also this age structure will affect um, urban regions. You know, if, if you look here, urban regions are barely breaking positive in terms of natural change and projections indicate that also they will slowly but surely become negative in terms of uh, a natural change. Migration is age and sex specific. Remember those maps I showed uh, with the uh, young adults being the most mobile and especially also young women more likely to move out of rural regions than, than, than men are. On the right here, you can see the, the, the median age and you can see some clear big differences between different parts of the EU with, for example, some countries like Ireland and Poland still having a relatively young population uh, compared to the rest of Europe, but some places really um, where half of the population is already above 50, right? So the, the darkest colors, which you can see in, in uh, Eastern Germany, except Berlin, you can see in, in the mountainous regions in Poland and then Northern Spain, but also in, in Greece and in Italy and in the interior of France, half of the population is 50 plus. And, and we're going to see an, a growth of that over time as more and more people age and the, and the younger cohorts uh, remain smaller in, in the next decades. So um, looking at the opinions of, uh, of rural residents and comparing them to city residents. So here, Please note, I'm no longer using the urban rural regional typology. We're not talking about that's three data. This is the by degree of urbanization. So classification of uh, the population by the type of municipality they live in. And so um, here, the differences aren't massive, but you can start to see a pattern, right? The proportion who's satisfied with their national democracy in cities or towns and suburbs is over 60%. In rural areas, it's 56%. So it's, you know, it's a little bit smaller. Um, if you look at the pattern per member states, the differences are small. You know, the main story here in this graph is well that the people living in Denmark are 90% satisfied with their national democracy, where the people in, living in Greece, it's 30%. So, you know, the, the member state level, the national level, tells you the most information about how likely somebody is. Uh, to be satisfied with the national democracy. Nevertheless, you can see, you know, if you see the blue dot at the top, it means that city residents are more satisfied than the other residents. And this is predominantly the case. You know, often you see the green dot low or lowest position and you see the blue dot higher, sometimes significantly so. So in general, trust within a member state, uh, well, satisfaction with national democracy is slightly higher in the cities than in the rural areas. And this is also reflected in turnout. So we looked at the national elections between 2013 and 18, and you can clearly see that at the European level, you know, you get 66 or 67% turnout in cities and towns and suburbs, in rural areas at 60%. Now, some of this may have to, uh, may, may, may be linked to the access um, to uh, voting booths, you know, the ease of voting uh, in a city or a town, it might be very close. The rural area may need to drive a little bit, but, uh, but obviously also turnout has an effect as we'll see later on which parties are likely to gain. And so 
this pattern, if we look at the country level results, it's not fully consistent. Sometimes, uh, you know, you see rural areas actually doing better. For example, here in Belgium, uh, they, they score higher. And also in Austria, the, the rural areas score much higher in terms of turnout than the cities. So it's a bit, uh, you know, it's an uneven pattern. But especially if you look here at the right hand side, uh, member states where the turnout is lower, sometimes the cities really have a significantly higher turnout, like in Estonia or Czechia or Hungary, or even Poland. So, you know, bigger turnout in cities there. Now, so we know they're less satisfied with national democracy. We know they're less likely to vote. Why would that be, right? So we're wanting to check a little bit. Um, are they likely to be active citizens? This is data from Eurostat. Uh, this is, by the way, a mixture of data from Eurostat and Eurobarometer. So um, here we're looking at Eurostat data. What par uh, part of them are active citizens? Meaning they signed a petition, you know, wrote to a politician or a member of a political organization, a party or a political association. And here again, you see a very consistent pattern. You know, city residents are considerably more likely to, to be active citizens, you know, roughly 15% versus 10. And here the towns and suburbs are more aligned with the rural areas. So really people living in cities are more actively engaged with politics than, than, than they are in rural areas. Now, the interesting thing to, to see is that this is not because rural residents don't volunteer, right? On the right-hand side, you can see that they are significantly more likely to volunteer as part of a formal volunteer activity, 20% you know, versus 16%. Um, so it's not endemic to rural life. It's not that rural residents are not active, it's just that they're just less active on the political uh, end of the spectrum. Are they interested in politics? Um, well, actually, they are less likely to frequently talk about politics. This is your barometer data, and clearly people in cities talk about politics more. You know, you get 18% versus 15% of the population that frequently discusses politics. And here the pattern's quite consistent, right? Cities typically have uh, a lot more political discussion happening in the last two years than, than in rural areas. Just kind of as a, as a joke, I, I put the share of people who were always happy or most of the time happy in the past four weeks and not discussing politics or discussing politics clearly doesn't seem to have an impact on average happiness because actually happiness is quite equally distributed uh, within the EU. The, the share of people who said they were always happy or most of the time happy is around you know 62% in both cities and rural areas and towns and suburbs. You see a little bit of a difference here and this will come back later again. Um, in places where happiness is high, so on the left-hand side of the graph, happiness is even higher in the rural areas than in the cities. And if you look on the right-hand side, where happiness is considerably lower, like in Bulgaria or Latvia, or Romania, Croatia, cities sometimes have a significantly uh, advantage. For example, in Portugal, city residents are more likely to be, be happy Lithuania as well, and in Bulgaria as well. So let's take a look at some, a few more data points before we get into the discussion of uh, the voting patterns. Um, this is from Eurostat looking at satisfaction with their job. And at the EU level, there is no difference between the three degrees of urbanization. Everybody gives the same average job satisfaction rating. But again, if you look closely and here, you have to look at the member state level distribution to see a pattern. Member states with a high level of job satisfaction, those in rural areas are even more satisfied. The ones with low satisfaction, you really clearly see an, a rural disadvantage or you know, a city bonus, if you will. If you have a job in a city, you're more likely to be satisfied with it. The differences with the satisfaction with their financial situation are small, but again, you see the same pattern emerge, slightly higher rural satisfaction levels in, in the affluent countries, slightly lower rural satisfaction levels in the less developed countries. And this is quite clear. You know, you see the Nordics all on the left and the rural areas score better. You see 
southern and eastern member states on the right, and there the cities really score better. But on average, at the EU level, it doesn't, you know, the differences kind of average out and get hidden. And this is also true for overall life satisfaction or satisfaction with personal relations. EU level, nada, nothing, identical um, satisfaction levels. But if you then look <clears throat> per member state, you can see that in high satisfaction, you have rural advantage in um, low satisfaction member states, you have rural disadvantage. And this is true for overall life as, as it is for personal relationships. So trying to wrap up this section here, you know, what do we see? We see quite a few differences. Um, you see disadvantages when it comes to trust and national democracy, likelihood to discuss politics, turnout, likelihood to be an active participant in political meetings, manifestations, um, survey, uh, petitions, etc. We see an advantage when it comes to volunteering, and this is also reflected in things like spending time with friends, spending time with family. And then we see a whole number of, of uh, indicators where at the EU level, it's neutral. But depending on the member state, there's a significant advantage or disadvantage to living in a rural area. And in part, this is also to do with where the affluent live, right? Uh, in, in, the, in the more developed member states, you can clearly see a tendency of the affluent to suburbanize or even move further out to live in a large, you know, large house with a large garden, um, a couple of cars out front. And that is also a little bit reflected here. And also, you know, the services and the infrastructure in those rural areas ensures a very high quality of life to, to, to people there. Now, coming to the last part of my presentation, I wanted to talk a little bit, and this is a paper, it's out there, the link is there, happy to share the presentation afterward. The urban-rural divide in anti-EU voting. You know, you see we have a different demographic profile, you have a different engagement with politics. How does this reflect into the voting? So we're trying to find out, do people differ by degree of urbanization in their tendency to vote for parties that are opposed to EU integration? And what drives that? And do those drivers differ between cities and rural areas? So we collected some data, which had been very interesting. I've actually published three papers on this, uh, the geography of EU discontent showing that cohesion policy reduces anti-EU voting. This is the third one looking at the urban rural dimension. So it's all based on the same data collection. We collected data for 60,000 electoral districts uh, for national elections between 2013 and 2018. And then we use the Chapel Hill expert survey to rate them uh, in terms of whether they support or oppose EU integration. Map on the right, you can see the results. Uh, regions or areas in purple have above EU average anti-EU vote. The ones in green, it's a below average share. And some actually it is zero or close to zero. So in the the dark green, for example, is between zero and 3%. Dark purple is more than 35%. So on average in the EU, 13% voted for a, a, a party opposed to EU integration. Wanted to give you a little bit of a trend dimension here. Um, so I'm gonna show you how this has evolved over the past 18 years. And on the far right side, you can see the EU. So we start out at 10% in 2000. And then it doesn't move much. It goes up and down a little bit over the years, even down a lot, so new wave, but then the crisis hits and we see big increases overall in, in anti-EU voting. So, you know, over that period, we see lots of countries have become more, of, you know, more likely to vote for, for parties opposed to EU integration. There's still quite a number of countries where this is a marginal or almost non-existent phenomenon. But we do see, for example, that in 10 member states, that vote share increased by 10 percentage points. Uh, so you can see, and it's a mixture, right? You know, some of the initial members of the EU like Italy, but also some more recent members, uh, um, affluent and less affluent member states here, you've got Greece and Finland. And Germany, uh, a country which historically had very low uh, shares of votes uh, against EU integration. So 
really quite uh, dramatic changes there over, over the past 20 years. Looking at the trust in the EU, we can see a similar pattern and, and these patterns are linked. Here, we only have data from 2004, but we'll move forward a bit. You can see as the years go by, you see on the right hand side, that bubble just keep going up and up and up, you know, and at a certain point it, it, it reaches almost 50% there of um, tending not to trust the EU. So really a big, big increase. And of course, this depends a little bit on uh, you know, events that happen. <laughs> <laughs> think of the economic crisis, the refugee crisis, but it also depends on how the EU responds and how that response is perceived as being appropriate or not. Uh, and so here we see nine member states uh, distrust increased by more than 20 percentage points um, um, and in 18 member states it increased by more than 10 percentage points. So here we see the share of the population 18, uh, 15 or over that tends not to trust the EU, right? And so overall, we see an increase from uh, around 28% to, to 40%, but it got close to 50% uh, at one point in that time. So this is the voting data that we used. I mentioned that earlier, 63,000 con electoral constituencies. Most member states, these are really small units, a municipal or smaller constituency. In five member states, we only had uh, uh, nuts three regions. But uh, speaking on behalf of the colleagues who worked on this for, for many, many weeks, it was not easy to do. <laughs> and so this is um, the, the, the results um, according to the seven point scale by the Chapel Hill expert survey. And you can see the parties that are strongly opposed, opposed or somewhat opposed and then these kind of red orangey colors. And you see, you know, it, it is a significant share of the overall vote. Uh, more than one in four voted for a party that was at least somewhat opposed to um, the EU. And then if we look at by degree of urbanization, we see a tendency, it's not universal, there's a few exceptions here at the bottom, but we see a tendency in rural areas to have a significantly higher vote share for parties that are opposed or strongly opposed to EU integration. And so this is what we're gonna investigate a little bit, trying to figure out what is driving this, uh, this, this pattern. So here we, we tested, you know, these are the typical box plots and you can see um, they are, oops, I missed the labels there a bit, but, uh, so you can see the rural areas on the left, uh, cities on the right and towns and suburbs in the middle. And you can clearly see that the, the, the box plots drop. Uh, and so both the, the, the median and the, the two quartiles are clearly below. And this is statistically significant, right? The difference between cities and rural areas is five percentage points lower uh, support for anti-EU parties in cities. So that's quite substantial, but also the difference between cities and towns and suburbs and uh, towns and suburbs and rural areas is significant. So we really have uh, something solid there. So looking a little bit at what the drivers could be, we are going to look at some economic indicators. We're going to look at some demographic indicators. We're going to look at some electoral indicators uh, and also look a little bit at where people uh, are born and also on some indicators of infrastructure quality. So what do we find? Um, in this study, we don't find a particularly strong impact of GDP per capita. Uh, in previous ones, working at different scales, we found uh, evidence that um, higher GDP per capita areas are actually prone to voting more uh, against the EU, but at the scale, we didn't replicate that result. GDP growth um, has a, a um, impact, but only, uh, only in rural areas, and surprisingly, it's positive. Um, unemployment rates clearly have, at NUTS2 level, have a, an impact, um, and it reduces it. Again, somewhat unexpected. The growth of the unemployment rate here, uh, you can clearly see that has a positive impact throughout. So more unemployment rate, more anti-EU votes. Interesting here, if we look at the data, this is from 2011 on the country of birth at NUTS3 level, if you're born in a different EU country, 
it tends to have uh, a, a reduction on the anti-EU vote in towns and suburbs and rural areas, but not in cities. If you're born outside the EU, it has an impact, it boosts anti-EU voting, and especially in rural areas, also in towns and suburbs, also in cities. So the, the, the irony, and you kind of highlight this, is that actually the, the, the presence of people born outside the EU has nothing to do with the EU. Um, allowing people from outside the EU into your country is a purely national competence, and the EU has nothing to say about that. So it's kind of surprising that um, you know, the, this, this demographic pattern on which the EU has zero influence actually leads to more uh, Euroscepticism. It's interesting to see that having more people from born in a different EU country actually reduces the, the uh, Euroscepticism. So actually having more people there from a different part of the Union actually tends to make people more favorable towards EU integration. Looking at the age structure, young, young adults 20 to 39 typically reduces Euroscepticism. Not such a not, not really a significant impact in cities, but definitely in towns and suburbs. Now the middle age, 40 to 64, they actually boost Euroscepticism only in towns and suburbs, but still this is a this is a bit surprising. And then the population over 65 also boosts Euroscepticism, but only in cities. Tertiary education reduces uh, Euroscepticism, uh, less so in cities, or not significant, but definitely in the other ones. Neighborhood density, so how closely people live together, reduces um, 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 Euroscepticism everywhere. This tends to mean that you know, the bigger cities are less Euroskeptic than the smaller ones. Towns are less Euroskeptic than suburbs, and villages are less Euroskeptic than dispersed rural areas. So the more concentrated the population, the more closer people live together, the less likely they are to, to vote against the EU. Then looking at the road performance, uh, there's a paper on this online we have written together with Hugo Pullman. It basically measures how well the road network functions. And the better the road network functions, the more people become Euroskeptic. Um, I kind of think of this as confidence or overconfidence. You know, the better the infrastructure, the less is the perception that you actually need the union. Uh, maybe we can go it alone. I think right now in the media, we see a lot of uh, uh, reports on what it means to go it alone in the case of the UK. But, um, voter turnout, lower, uh, higher turnout means less Eurosceptic voting. So uh, clearly there's a, a, a strong pattern there. Trying to summarize this impact a little bit. Um, Declining GDP has only an impact in rural areas. Increasing unemployment boosts it everywhere. Higher tertiary education reduces it, but not so much in cities. EU born outside the EU boosts it everywhere. Born in another EU member state drops it, but not in cities. And here you get this uh, um, impact of the middle age, and here you get the impact of the young population, which again doesn't affect cities so much, which are mostly driven by, by the presence of older population. Better infrastructure, more Euroscepticism, higher neighborhood density lowers, and then higher turnout lowers. Before wrapping up, I wanted to look a little bit at, um, so by degree of urbanization, do you see a different pattern of what indicators are, are the most important? Um, the biggest impact comes from the country effect. And we saw that in a lot of the graphs I showed, right? Remember the big difference between uh, satisfaction with national democracy between Greece and, and Finland, I think it was. So the country has a huge impact on how likely someone is to, to vote against the EU. This is to do with national political factors and national economic factors, et cetera, that, that we don't capture here. But once you take that into account, it differs what is the most important. The biggest driver in rural areas are, are economic variables. You know, looking at GDP and unemployment really explains a much bigger chunk of the anti-EU vote in rural areas than elsewhere. If we look at towns and suburbs, it's much more the socio-demographic indicator. So age composition, uh, the presence of foreign born or, or born in a different EU member state, where in cities, um, it's really the electoral variables that matter. Turnout has, has, has a real big impact there. 
on uh, what um, on what people vote for. So again, you can see not only that you have a different uh, voting pattern, but also what explains that voting pattern differs by degree of urbanization. So we find that, how do we conclude? Look at higher education really reduces uh, uh, voting for Eurosceptic parties. And this is consistent in all the papers that I've, that I've seen on this. A higher share of young people is negatively correlated with the anti-EU vote. Um, higher share of older population positively correlated. And in some cases, like in those towns and suburbs, we found also the middle-aged share is positively correlated to the anti-vote. In the cities, it's not younger and middle-aged, it's that have an impact, it's the old. And in the rural areas, the, the, the younger age has a negative impact on, on, on Eurosceptic voting. So looking a little bit at the presence of, of the foreign born, you see a high share of people from other EU countries lowers the anti-EU votes uh, and specifically in rural areas, a higher share of people born outside the EU, there's a higher vote for anti-EU parties, but again, especially in rural areas and turnout reduces uh, anti-EU voting. Economic drivers, rising unemployment increases support for anti-EU parties and particularly in cities uh, and towns and, and suburbs. GDP, in this study, we didn't find a big impact. Neighborhood density tends to reduce and Eurosceptic. And that infrastructure one is, is quite interesting because actually we, we do find evidence uh, uh, in other studies as well that a very high level of confidence in the national economy and the national government and national democracy leads to a lower appreciation of the EU and, and a higher tendency towards Euroscepticism. And here that infrastructure might be a reflection of like the confidence that they can go it alone. So I think I've managed to stay more or less within the time uh, and I'm happy to open the floor for questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Louis, for this very, very broad and comprehensive uh, uh, picture of the um, anti-EU vote, especially the rural anti-vote uh, in the EU. So we will start immediately because there are a few questions. So um, um, I will start them. I will uh, take them one by one, if possible. So the first one is about the, the, the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, the question is, what trends do you see from COVID-19 crisis on rural areas? It's a bit okay. apart, but okay, it's in, in the target nowadays. We, we, we have started to look at this. Um, first thing to say is COVID-19 is ongoing, right? We're still in the middle of it. Um, and so we have emerging evidence. Um, evidence from the first wave was very clear. Uh, two strong patterns. COVID-19 arrived earlier in urban regions and after it arrived, it spread faster. So clearly the proximity uh, between people, the, the maybe more frequent interactions in cities allowed COVID-19 to spread faster. Um, also in terms of excess mortality, we found that to be significantly higher in, in, um, in urban regions than in rural regions. This was also the case in the first wave in the US. However, the, the second wave and now the third wave or you know, the ongoing wave, because it really never uh, dropped that far, um, shows a different pattern in the US. You see a higher a rate of infections and a higher speed in rural areas than you do in urban areas. In the EU so far, we only have partial evidence on say the second half of the year, um, but there we still see a rural uh, advantage when it comes to COVID-19. So um, of course this is doubly important because A, we have more old people in rural regions and they are clearly more susceptible to, to, to uh, or, or you know, their fatality rates once infected are, are significantly higher. And second of all, the distance to the nearest healthcare facility is significantly longer. So, I mean, they are more vulnerable to this. So the, it's great to see that so far they have been spared some of the, the impacts that the urban regions have suffered. Okay, thank you very much. There's another question, which is slightly or uh, completely different. And it is, is there a clear evidence that a negative natural population change is associated with increase in wealth and well-being. 
So it re relates to the start of your speech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a good question, and it's, it's a question that pops up frequently. Um, the one thing we see, um, negative natural change is driven by two factors, right? It's the age structure of the population and it's the, 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 the fertility rates and the death rates. Um, in Europe, we've had fairly low fertility rates for a very long time. The rest of the world, you can see a drop in fertility rates quite significantly. And it really helps if we educate women and, and if we become more affluent, um, more affluent and the more educated uh, uh, women are in a country, uh, the, the lower the number of children tends to be. Um, is that, does that mean that they're happier? <laughs> they have higher uh, well-being? I think they have more choices, right? If you have a higher education, you have more options in your life, you may have a bit more control over your life or understanding of, of the choices. Um, higher income obviously expands your choices and your options. So I don't necessarily think that natural change is, is, is problematic. And in, and in some cases, it can improve people's uh, uh, well-being. Will it increase their wealth? Uh, well, we all spend money on our kids. I think if we have fewer kids, we probably just spend more on our kids. So I'm not sure it makes us uh, uh, necessarily uh, more affluent but it changes uh, our behavior relative to, to the reduced number of children. Overall, I think um, Europe has a fairly stable and, and, and low fertility rate, and that's not about to change. Um, so I think we should prepare ourselves for a continuing and a growing uh, reduction of, of, uh, of a population. So uh, I think it's key to really understand how we can manage this. You know, already today, 40% of the EU population lives in a region that lost population over the last five years. Projections indicate that this is going to grow to 50 to 60% over, over the coming decades. So really the challenge for us is how do we manage population reductions in such a way that it doesn't reduce well-being or affects our wealth? Okay, thank you very much. There is a question about the relation between the anti-EU vote and the EU law. And the question is, uh, can this distrust collide with compliance rates with the EU law? And further, are there any remedies to fill that knowledge gap? Very difficult question. Mm. <laughs> I think being part of the EU, it's not a, you know, it's not a competition or it's not a popularity contest, right? Uh, the EU has a complicated role. Um, for a long time, its role was very odd in the sense that it was a, um, a scapegoat. You know, it meant it could easily be blamed for decisions which were in the short term politically not very popular. Um, and so for a long time, the EU could easily be blamed for regulations which were supported by member states behind closed doors. And then, you know, prime minister or minister went back to the country and oh, look at what Brussels is making us do. And Brussels kind of acquiesced, you know, these votes were, were secret. Uh, we didn't say, hey, everybody supported this. Why are you blaming us for something you actually support? Um, and the trade-off was clear. The EU becomes less popular, but we get the decisions we need. Um, as a short-term strategy, it can work. As a medium-term strategy, it clearly has consequences. We've lost our first member state. Uh, I hope I don't see more of them losing. So I think the scapegoat role is a little tricky. Um, it's also a very uneven fight, right? There are politicians quite happy to blame us for things which we have no role in. There are also politicians quite happily to spread uh, incorrect information about how much it costs to be a member of the EU. A lot of the benefits of the membership of the EU are quite intangible, so it's, it's difficult. Um, that having said, I definitely think there are decisions uh, made by the by the Commission and by the Council that, uh, in hindsight, were, were suboptimal or, or you know people may regret. Or, for example, the you know the, the the fast move to austerity after the financial crisis was not particularly popular. 
infringement procedures there are many different ones uh, some of them i have quite popular support other ones less um, some are very technical uh, when i think of state aid or tax treatment of multinationals but there you know you see the mood changing um, certain point there was not so much interest now uh, you see a much more support for uh, ensuring that multinationals pay the fair amount of taxes infringements of state aid they're they're complicated i don't know if they really have a big impact on on, on popular opinion um filling the knowledge gap <laughs> Uh, I think it's very difficult for us to communicate what the EU does, and we really rely heavily on, on national politicians and, and trusted uh, spokespersons inside the country to, to accurately represent the impact of the union. Um, if you look at uh, Timmermans, our vice president, he really said that you know, when we're trying to defend the EU, our credibility is, is much lower because people just assume that we're going to say that we're good and useful. And it's much more credible if somebody else actually tells the population that, hey, these are some of the real benefits of the union. So really what we need to bridge that knowledge gap is, is actually people being clear and more honest about uh, the benefits and the costs uh, of, of EU membership. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are a few technical questions, so we'll turn to them afterwards. But first, I will take advantage of my position to ask you one question that is still in my mind, and that's about the very strange relation between the anti-EU vote and the level of infrastructure. How can you explain that? Because, okay, I mean, originated from a very poor place, and I see exactly the same uh, results, and uh, that's quite surprising in the end. So, uh, do you have an explanation about this? Yeah, no, it's it's a uh, it's a question that we have also asked ourselves, right? I mean, what does cohesion policy do? Uh, for for decades, we have invested in infrastructure, trying to to allow for for more. Uh, smooth mobility of people, of goods, of travel, uh, etc. Are we undermining support for the union by investing in infrastructure? Of course, it's an important question for us all. Um, the 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 way I interpret these figures is really that it is um, an indication of how confident people are that. Um, their government, their situation would be uh, just as fine outside the EU as inside the EU. So I think it's related. I mean, if you live in an area where infrastructure is poor, you know, clearly you see the need for more public investment. And you may think, well, maybe my national government is not going to do this alone or cannot finance this alone. And we need, uh, um, uh, you know, we need a coalition. We need also more support from the EU to really try and improve the quality of life in our regions, the, the economic opportunities and, and the mobility. I think when you look at, at regions that are extremely affluent um, um, and, and, and have a high quality of infrastructure, that perception of, of a need for, for additional support might be lower. And if you look, for example, in the UK, I know in this and these some of these studies and these studies that they were still included in our analysis, you can clearly see that it wasn't the poor places who necessarily voted anti-EU, right? There were a lot of very affluent areas that had a, uh, voted to leave the union. And also, if you look at anti-EU uh, sentiment or anti-EU voting in general, there are some of the extremely developed member states with high shares of anti-EU voting. I think of Denmark, I think of Sweden. These places are not poor, but clearly their confidence in their national government, their appreciations for these kind of difficult multilateral negotiations to find a compromise is lower if they think their government is so good that they don't really need all this messy European stuff. So this is this is how I interpret that. It's it's the confidence that you know being part of this larger union doesn't really provide uh, uh, enough benefits to to be worth the effort. Obviously, I work for the EU union, so I have a biased opinion. But I actually think 
they, they overestimate their capacity of going it alone and you know fundamentally underestimate the, the benefits the union provides but who would believe me i'm obviously oh, that's a tricky issue for sure <laughs> so, well, thank you very much to make the effort to try to answer uh, there are um, two technical questions if i can go to them so one is about i will pull them one is about um uh, and the, the as follow could you give us a bit more details on the empirical approach employed to estimate the different influence of drivers across urban rural areas and the other one is um about the the possibility to integrate the um uh, the, the share of women participating in the job market alongside unemployment rates in the final regression. Okay. I'll start with the second question because it's the easiest one. Um, so when analyzing these electoral districts, we try and find data with a high spatial resolution. Um, and for some, this is quite difficult to find. Uh, for example, we were able to proxy employment rates by looking at employment at nuts three from regional accounts and looking at working age population. So it gives you a little bit uh, an impression of the concentration of jobs in a particular area relative to the working age population. But it's not technically the, 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 the employment rate from the labor force survey. Labor force survey only produces nuts two data. So when we use education, uh, we could only use NUTS2 data to get uh, the share of women uh, uh, in, in the labor market. Again, we would be forced to go to NUTS2 uh, uh, level. You know, in the EU, there's like, there's only 270 NUTS2 regions. And so that's not a lot of points of observation, right? And a lot of countries are an entire NUTS2 region. So once you add a country dummy there, uh, you, you lose that. We did it for education because it's such an important factor. We haven't tried it for uh, uh, the share of women participating in the job market, primarily because we're concerned about not having enough observations there, just not having the spatial resolution to do so. Um, I'm really looking forward to the to new census results because then we would get a much finer and a much more recent uh, analysis of, of these patterns. And that would then allow us to, again, start investigating more recent elections, also using more recent Chapel Hill expert survey. There's a new one that came out late last year uh, to understand how these patterns have evolved. Um, so, so there, I'm, I'm optimistic we'll, we'll be able to understand that better. From the work we're doing for the, the rural vision, we have seen that um, employment rates for women in rural areas are significantly lower relative to men as compared to cities. So women, uh, rural employment rates for women are substantially lower uh, relative to men uh, than, than in cities. So there is a penalty in a sense for, for women remaining in rural areas, which may, you know, may be one of the reasons we see this, uh, this uh, higher tendency to move to, to urban regions. On the uh, technical question, I have to say, I relied on uh, Nicola Pompeolo, my co-author, to do um, the statistical analysis. Uh, the paper's online, it, it's quite detailed, specifies all the uh, uh, indicators we use, the spatial resolution we had them in, and, and the different statistical techniques. I mean, he used a, a variety of, of methods. I mean, the primary one is a, a multiple regression one, but we also use different methods to estimate how much uh, each indicator contributes to explaining the variation uh, uh, we, we observed. But I have to be honest, I'm not a statistician, so I, I'm, I'm not, not uh, entirely comfortable trying to explain the technical detail of those. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Luis. So I think that now more or less we're done and uh, it's finished. So I want to really thank you about uh, your presentation, about these um, very in inspiring uh, insights. And I'm sure that, okay, you already published a lot of things on that, but pretty clear that you have uh, other things in your bag. So thank you very much and uh, a nice day. and. Um, for the all the